And that's why I changed to German. Please do not dig around on the campground. In the following talk, we talk about how we digged on the uh, lawn of the Reichstag. So I want to welcome the speaker. He is not from the center of politisch Schönheit, political beauty, uh, and political organization. Digging around on the uh, lawn of the Reichstag and other goals of political... Welcome to the talk. Um. Perspectives for civil disobedience. I'm not from the Center for Political Beauty, as has been said. I have dealt for years in theory and practice with communication, guerrilla, and civil disobedience. And I think both forms of action, whether separate or in combination, are powerful tools for political protest. And <clears throat> this will not be so much about communication, guerrilla, but about civil disobedience. Civil disobedience, uh, that's perhaps the first thing we think of are people like Mahatma Gandhi and uh, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, or the good old sitting blockade. But there's more that can be done. Um, civil disobedience uh, is a very large range of, of, of action forms. You can have lots of fun with that. And what I think is rather important, we can free us, ourselves from, from the lethargy and, and, and powerlessness that we feel and, uh, <clears throat> and empower ourselves and, and get something done politically. So what then is civil disobedience at all? <clears throat> First of all, some theoretical background. What exactly is it? Uh, the word uh, is first read from Henry David Thoreau. He has been one of the four thinkers of civil disobedience. He lived in the 19th century, and he wrote about the obligation to civil disobedience. That was one of his works. Thoreau has two um, axioms. First, the authority of a government is based on <clears throat> the agreement of those that are governed, and second, Justice is more important than individual laws, and every individual can judge whether laws are just. And from that follows for him, if the law is set up in a way that um, it necessarily makes you uh, un on the wrong side of the law, then, then, then break the law. If it necessarily puts you on the wrong side of the law, break it. Um, as this is a shortened version of what Thoreau wrote. It's not just about breaking laws. Civil disobedience is not about breaking laws only. Uh, in recent theory, this has become much broader. Obligations, um, orders, rules, norms, conventions can all be broken during civil disobedience. And what's important here is it's not a simple fuck you. Um, not about a single fuck you, a simple fuck you, but it's more like a, a balancing process between different rules, your own rules, and those from the law. And, and this kind of civil disobedience, uh, um, there are three points that are important about this to make up the core of it. Um, foremost, it's reasons of conscience uh, to, to put, an, put something that's wrong right. Um, my reasons of conscience and the moral and the law um, are above the laws of the land and the orders. And to then tr tr transgress the law is a decision of, of, of conscience to, um, to put things right. You have to do this consciously and you have to accept that through breaking the law you can actually face penalties. And in that there is a power of civil disobedience because you consciously break rules or laws for political and moral reasons. And the third point is <coughs> the is nonviolence. You see Wolfgang Thierse, president of the German parliament at a time, blockading a Nazi demonstration. Now this is a a nonviolent breach of a law, 
not in this in the sense that it's never directed against the dignity of the human being um, civil disobedience excludes violence against human beings and according to Gandhi nonviolence has um, moral as well as fact factual reasons tactical reasons so civil disobedience is always in a kind of tension between legitimacy and illegality. Therefore, actions of civil disobedience always have to legitimize themselves. You have people that will say, you, you're breaking the law, you're legal, you're doing something that's forbidden. This will always happen if you are engaging in civil disobedience. And, and this is, becomes a negotiation process in, within society and a peaceful sitting blockade uh, against Nazis or something is uh, now widely accepted or almost accepted in society, at least appreciated as something that's part of it. It used to be quite different in the 60s and 70s. And these things can change. And next to the practice, uh, you therefore always need explanations, communication of what you do. And, and this negotiation process in, the, in, in Germany um, in the 80s, uh, when it was about nuclear weapons, um, uh, renowned intellectuals took part in, in, in these blockades. And there was a huge debate about legality and legitimacy of civil disobedience. And, and Habermas, one of those intellectual, um, declared civil disobedience as legitimate, but within certain rules, within certain frameworks. And <clears throat> it has to be public. It has to be pre-announced. Um, it has to be symbolic. Um, and has to be calculable by the police. Um, this excludes certain things, which is why I would like to suggest an expanded sense of civil dis disobedience that also includes actions that go beyond the symbolic meaning, uh, covered, unannounced actions that the state, the opponent, cannot foresee. Um, this has to include actions by communication guerrilla, um, things that uh, may disobey rules of classical process or use them in an unexpected way, and actions that go against non-state players like companies. And uh, this is about uh, expanding the repertoire of protest uh, and uh, de develop the instrument of civil disobedience further. In the following part, I will talk about different cases of civil disobedience that are extend the area of civil disobedience or make the form of civil disobedience stronger and show it more clearly and show what's possible with it. So what Habermas was not in, did not include was whistleblowing, that if the surveillance state gets more and more important, it democratic um, control has to be import is important and so whistleblowing is part of civil disobedience because the reasons are moral and it is known and it is not violence so we have to make sure that whistleblowing is normal that they don't have to do civil disobedience but are <laughs> covered by law However, if gov uh, journalists publish documents, it's not civil disobedience, but they're right. And we just defended that. And if the government were uh, would have succeeded, we would have a problem with that. If we would have to fight against the uh, constitution of Germany with the... Um, and thank you, therefore, that you supported nextpolitik.org in the recent weeks. That is a combination of civil disobedience and also the law of freedom of press. So there's another way to get to information. And there we also have a problem with breaking of the rules about getting information. In this case, the hack of the hacking team who someone anonymous made these uh, moral decisions that they wanted to publish the information about this f company with the 400 gigabyte of data. And the interesting thing is 
that a non communicated decision about the civil disobedience and the people who look at this data and communicate it with the public. So it shows that this organization works against the human rights. So we have whistleblowing and a cleanup for the public city. Hacking for companies and uh, governmental organizations that are against basic rights can be decide, uh, called whistleblowing. It is an important communication role. They just uh, explained forms of civil disobedience are quite strict, but it doesn't have always to be strict. For example, there was a group up against the wall that was called up against the wall motherfucker that were active in the US and they made a nice situations and maybe they made a uh, the one of the best ones it was the mill in in the in a, and they went into a uh, and they and they uh, destroyed stuff they made it dirty they gave away the uh, um, and they put cats there and in the end a lot of people had to be taken down from out of the and then there was King Mob a British group uh, shown here they went into a department store in London dressed up as Chris Father Christmases and distributed um, toys to children and police came the children had to give them back and <laughs> Father Christmas figures were arrested so, and these two actions are about breaking rules and uh, questioning conventions and they use the the means of confusion and camouflage to, to break what people are used to and, and camouflage and fake is also what the next action is about the space hijackers a communication guerrilla in London that unfortunately very sadly have dissolved. One of their nicest actions among many great ones is the tank stunt at the G20 protests in, in London. Uh, the space hijackers for 2,000 pounds bought this, this old tank or armored vehicle, painted it blue, and during the protests, as fake police people uh, went to the Royal Bank of Scotland and offered help to the police people against those evil rioters, and, and the police <laughs> declined and, and, and arrested those hijackers and, and uh, charged them with impersonating police officers. In 2011, two years later, the charges were dropped. And the most, the nicest thing of this action was that immediately after, the, immediately after the arrest, the police confiscated the vehicle and uh, didn't know that that the motor had to be kept running uh, for the for the brakes to work. And uh, and the hijackers then watched these people yeah, with that vehicle damaging buildings and then roads because they couldn't brake. <laughs> anymore. Um, so fun with protest and, and questioning authority uh, uh, to put together gives you um, embarrassing the police. And to go, get to something more serious now, we get to the action called The Dead Are Coming. On a Monday in June, this, the Center for Political Beauty started their action, action called the Dead Are Coming. Um, perhaps wait for the next Congress, whether we would, well, they, well, they will be talking about this. And this action can be seen as a prime example w how with a lot of morals and, and some political background and an action that really breaks moral conventions. In a week, you can win 7,000 people for civil disobedience. Basically, this action was about um, making people aware of the 23,000 dead at the European borders and making these visible. And this action was to have several levels. First of all, burying refugees in Germany, and then uh, a, a putting up a mem memorial at the chancellor's office, breaking up the soil that was all announced. Um, they were going to start work for, for this monument. Uh, the action began on a Monday. Uh, on the Tuesday, the first refugee was buried. Um, 
the group had uh, exhumed bodies of refugees in Sicilia with, with the uh, agreement of their relatives, brought them to Germany, and uh, of course, there's always a huge provocation involved if you deal with uh, with corpses and, and dead people. But but this opened up a space for a debate about um, the, the deaths that are taking place and, of course, brought a lot of attention to the demo that was going to take place on the Saturday, uh, the March of the Resolved. Now, what happened during the week was uh, suddenly... Um, someone at the Oranienplatz in Berlin, someone put up a, a grave. This was no one involved, uh, connected to the Center for Political Beauty. And this went viral. In hundreds of European cities, um, people started to dig up grave mounds on public space, in, in public grounds, and a few hashtags and tumble blog uh, raising the visibility, visibility of these things is all that, that's needed. And, uh, and Due to all these graves that had been put up throughout Europe and, and mostly Germany, there was a kind of civil disobedience was created that seemed legitimate. And uh, <clears throat> this happened in, in, in cities, in parks, in front of town halls. Of course, there was a problem putting up that memorial with, with diggers and, 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 and hammers and all that. Uh, that was not going to happen. There was a talk with the authorities. Um, and all kinds of authorities got involved. When things get more dangerous, more authorities get involved. Now, this actually involved 12 authorities, the Federal Criminal Police Office and the Health Authority of, of Central Berlin. Everyone was very concerned. And on the Friday, one day before the march of, of the determined, the police um, forbid forbade uh, the use of diggers and, and carrying of corpses and then the centrum then reacted with the center reacted with this text without any irony we ask you for the following do not go in masses carrying coffins at the chancellor's office in no case organize yourselves and so on and this is then what happened 7,000 people uh, joined the march of the determined went to the parliament where uh, fences had been put up around the parliament and suddenly um, somehow the fence didn't hold anymore and, and these 7,000 7, people then flooded the lawn in front of parliament in a very determined way. Um, they were not running, they were slow. Um, it really was a very beautiful act of civil disobedience. Everyone was entering this lawn and right at the center of power <clears throat> between the chancellor's office and parliament graves were being dug up uh, well not dug up <laughs> created grave mounds were being created and and the police uh, even for an hour the police with all their determination were not able to prevent this um, uh, they were being pushed back all the time but um, 91 people were arrested in the end as many as in the 1st of May riots that often take place in Berlin. The largest action of civil dis disobedience in Berlin for the last few years. And it really put put the spirit of disobedience into the heart of the capital. All kinds of people, hipster hippies, hacker, left radicals, theater people, a nice mixture. And that was that's one of the strengths of civil disobedience that you have a very broad range of, of actors, not just one group. And then it it gets much more difficult to to prevent this. So you have <clears throat> this rare combination of of action art and mass civil disobedience, leading to something like political poetry, and and and, and creating an arena for this very important topic. Also, uh, from <clears throat> from uh, from the refugee topic, migration topic, there was a, um, an action that. Um, that kind of got covered up in the whole treason affair, but the Peng Collective, which is which always do very funny and good actions, put up a, a high-profile campaign, a very a very stylish kind of campaign, classic call to break laws, <clears throat> calling on people to 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 use the holidays and pick up refugees and and get them across the border with a very well done video, looked very professional, showing how helping refugees can work. And the nice thing about this campaign was 
Uh, first, it, it set a contrast to all those racist riots that took place in the country against asylum homes. It, 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 it argued in strictly moral way, but, but, but gave concrete advice on how to uh, on how to get through the borders if you're carrying a refugee as a passenger. Um, it collected money for legal assistance to those people that would get caught, and and this image of of the bad, the uh, the evil traffickers that that is always being transported is now contrasted with the image of the good citizen that it helps a refugee. And uh, even though this wasn't very legal, the, the mass media was communicating this in in evil uh, at an evil range, and and uh, the. the Far right wing FPO in in in, in Austria uh, was was fuming about you know calling for the smuggling of asylum seekers. You, this this can't be done. You know the the FPO was was very much against this. And uh, then right wing conspiracy th conspiracy theorists read the. Uh, uh, who is entry for that domain and, and, and found the Ayn Rand Institute and immediately thought this is a US-based conspiracy um, and US NGO, great. Uh, if things like that happen, you really have done, done everything right. Will the PR campaign that works uh, with the call for civil disobedience towards the mass, not only to the left alternative, but towards the mass, that languages and nationalities are very important. And also from the same organization, there was a following very nice communication guerrilla action where they, the artists put up a wrong press conference of the in fake press conference in the main office of Vattenfall and it appeared to be quite easy. You only need a suit an iPad with mails that say, hey, I am allowed to do a press conference here. And immediately everybody de believes it. And in this case, they believe that Vattenfall was part of the good ones because... The message was that we'll stay, we'll stay in southeastern Germany, well, in eastern Germany, and, and, and rearrange, realign their business completely to renewable energies. And in this case, Vattenfall had to disannounce the hat and say, we are not a part of the good. But in the end, everybody knew they will never sue, because that way they will be in, in public again and again. You can do those things if you are in a moral higher place than the companies who have a lot of, are afraid about that. But being against the rules is also can also be quite low uh, key but still have a quite big effect in this case they impersonated someone so next to the we go return from communication gorilla and go to the uh, massive um, in this case they removed the gravel from the gra uh, from the uh, train tracks to those that the trains can't run anymore. Train tracks used by the nuclear waste transports. They called about that month in advance. And one of the effects that happened was that a large debate happened about that, about the form of protest. And big papers published about the subject where they talk about whether that's okay. So even if you just announce civil disobedience, debates about political subjects can also can be put on the agenda and you can use them and yeah, cause demonstrations with that. It's a great tool to put up um, political discussions. Some important people supported it. In Wendland, later 7,000 people were part of it. The police was concentrated very much on those that removed the gravel, which was the most important one. It Not only the removing of gravel was important, but also the usage of passive weapons is, is not allowed. So you mustn't protect yourself against uh, the g gas, the train gas. 
So in this case, it was we don't work against humans, and with except of very few special cases, uh, everybody take um, accepted that. So part of the thing that removing the gravel was yeah well they did not work well against the gra removing of gravel but the important thing was that everybody talked about it and it arrived in the mainstream it this term for removing of gravel was word of the year and it was also used in different protest act in this case the removal of the gravel shows what's all possible with the uh, civil disobedience. So a wide discussion, range of discussion was feasible. Another thing where, which was quite, uh, there's quite a time back, is how you can play against the police that is much more important, uh, bigger. In this case, it was about block G8 in Harling in Dam where many people wanted to block the streets towards the center. And in front of them, there were a lot of policemen and um, soldiers who stand in against them. And despite the military action, the blockades were imp successful. You have to imagine this. The police was on every street with several, uh, and there were military helicopters and everywhere were police and uh, with the um, tear gas and despite that demonstrants were active and part of that was the five finger tactic the five finger tactic is quite easy it unfortunately only works in open country and not in this town and they do this and the five finger tactic the Protestants turn into several fingers, and they, in a long line, they walk towards the street that has to be blocked. And in the open country, in this process with 7,000 policemen, you can't defend a road. So the police will always look at the first finger first, and some of the others will go through. And even if the police arrives, you can split again. So there was a situation where 100 policemen came and they finger split and the police did not know where to go, whether to go to the right or to the left. So the tactic of police can be circumvented like that. And if you circumvent police like that, you will also gain victory about the image of the, uh, the, the war of the images, in this case, Peaceful people walked through fields and color uh, and f um, flower fields, but on the other hand, the police that with helicopters storm against them. So in this case, if we do massive civil disobedience and a well thought out tactic, we will or might have successes. Important on that this example is that political action without the uh, uh, pa parliament. Usually nothing happens after a demonstration, but after an act of civil disobedience, you will always, you probably have small aim you, you succeeded in. So you mustn't, um, during, while they dug grave and after they came home, they were quite happy and there was a lot of power and you take the people with you and they talk about it. And small successes are also good. Now let's move on to what else is possible, but this is not a call to copy what's coming. Um, you all know ab about the throwing of tarts, and as a kind of action, as a form of action, this man from Belgium uh, invented this, and he called it his main aim to uh, to to tart as many um, self-obsessed and, and unjust people, as he put it. Now, this involves a cream tart with a soft uh, base, um, not with frozen cherries or something. Um, and this is then pressed or thrown onto the target. Uh, now, here is uh, an, uh, an example against Bill Gates in 1989. In Germany, 
um, throwing the tart, unfortunately, is not well accepted and, and, it, and is judged as violent. And uh, this was seen when Theodor zu Gutenberg, uh, well, a controversial politician, uh, was uh, subjected to a tart in Belgium and, and Holland. This is quite different. Now, the strength of throwing tarts is in the viral spread of the images that are being produced. Um, a well-known tart thrower in Amsterdam said in a talk recently, media can't resist. It always works. This is naked protest. Uh, this is something you just do, and uh, it will get into the media, surely. But as tarts are not that popular here in Germany, there's another creamy kind of um, in development, and this is glitter bombing. Uh, throwing glitter onto someone and spreading the political message that way. This was started in the US and mostly used in the fight against homophobic politicians. Here is an example. Newt Gingrich. But uh, you can, of course, extend it to other topics. For example, Mario Draghi, the head of the European Central Bank. See how scared he looks there in the corner. This is what happened recently <clears throat> as a protest against the treating of Greece, the treatment of Greece. You could think it further and, and, use, and, and, and choose politicians that transgress basic laws, ba basic rights or companies that sell espionage software or tools. Uh, the important thing about glittering is that you have to document it yourself or make sure that enough media is present to ensure that enough pictures are created. And this is much more uh, easily accepted than, than throwing tarts. It's much harder to turn this into a crime, a criminal charge. Uh, use the uh, kind of glitter that is more coarse making it harder to, to be breathed in, and that will then be even more safe against criminal prosecution. But please don't do it. Um, another thing, uh, in Germany, we uh, celebrate people that in the January of 1989, uh, 1990, sorry, January 1990, stormed the Stasi offices. This was a few months after the wall fell. And in view of of those of the current scandals like of surveillance, uh, it might actually be justified to uh, face secret services, make them face civil disobedience to to fire the debate about their legitimacy. As long as the only consequence of Snowden is that data retention is introduced and, and uh, secret service budgets are being increased, we have to ask ourselves, oh, we're having no pictures here, some problems with the pictures. Have you ever squatted a secret service? We have to ask ourselves which mosaic pieces uh, in the fight for civil rights uh, are still there, and, and civil disobedience surely is one of those. And that brings us back to the question, what civil dis dis disobedience is good for? Emancipative self-empowerment, says this slide. It's good because it is self-empowerment. When Rosa Parks in 1955 sat down in a bus in the, in the South, in the US South, refusing to free her space for a white person and, and got arrested, this was one of the starting points of the civil rights movements in the US. And <clears throat> subsequently, this movement succeeded in democratically rem removing segregation in the US. So disobedience sets a sign and, and can have an effect and can motivate others to, to join. And civil disobedience is participative and it's solidaric. Um, you have to re you have to be able to rely on each other. And in most actions of civil disobedience, you can see the tenderness of solidarity. Sitting down in a blockade with with unknown people and uh, or being helped by people. If if you if you have tear gas or spray and thrown into your eyes because you have to stand together, you're breaking the law together. And in a world in which we are told every day we um, have to extend a hand in solidarity and, and um, this, this is very fitting and we could see this in, in the last few weeks 
uh, the good old platitude, um, something is a weapon. Which is a weapon? What, what did he say? Um, love, I guess, is a weapon. Um, and there are more reasons. Um, you can celebrate small successes if your opponents uh, uh, block a lawn, you can't demonstrate, um, you can't demonstrate close to parliament, uh, and suddenly still, it, despite the presence of the police, someone succeeds in doing exactly that. You can set a sign against uh, the dying in the Mediterranean that the government takes for granted or, or accepts, and uh, this is really that this is very empowering. And uh, if you have ever taken part, um, you will never forget the experience. Um, protests of all kinds strengthens the immunity of the democratic society and. Uh, and it's a form that can change the world to, for the better. And, of course, fun, having fun with protests should not be neglected. These are people protesting against huge rents as they uh, go for a, a viewing of a property that is to be rented out. You can temporarily take possession of something. If you want to change the world, it has to be make fun. You have to be able to dance. It, it won't work otherwise. Now, the next strength of civil disobedience is you can forge new alliances. And particularly, dis civil disobedience is a chance for forming broad alliances because um, you agree to a, to a consensus of, of action. And because you have to stick together for it to work, these alliances tend to be stronger than others. and. They are not something arbitrary. Um, the more the punk with the grandmother and the left radical and the social democrat go together, the stronger the social movement is and the harder it is to attack it. And you can create public publicity that way, calling for dis civil disobedience. Winning prominent celebrities uh, um, will give you publicity even months before the event. This is Charlotte Roach, a well-known German-English TV personality. And it extends democracy. It is a chance to really develop democrat democracy. It, it, it democratizes in institutions and uh, develops it further, radicalizes and extends it even against the state. And that's how I want to close. Thank you very much, and don't forget dare more civil disobedience here. Thank you for listening. Your translators were Sebastian. And um, We haven't defined a hashtag for your feedback, but I hope you've been able to follow us and you've enjoyed the translations. I guess I'll call for the hashtag CCCampEN if you want to write something on Twitter. Monserrat, thanks a lot for this talk. We have a lot, a lot of time left for questions. The microphones are to the left and right in, in the aisles. Someone is at the microphone. I can't see. If so, is there anyone there? OK, please start. Left microphone, please. Hello. Yes. First of all, thank you very much for your presentation. I really liked it. Um, another addition I thought about that the FIFA boss Splatter was thrown at real money, which also, I also liked quite a bit, which was fitting. My question now, I have a feeling that in the recent years, or maybe through the last year, the civil disobedience grew or was more public, uh, gained more publicity. Do you think the same? I don't really have the impression that it's grown a lot. There have been a few good campaigns that have been so strong that uh, they may create the impression. But um, I think that in the last few years, there was a development that started 
at the G8 summit in Heiligendamm in northeastern Germany and, and the large alliance that, um, that now blockades Nazi demos and uh, and this really got into the heart of society and, and was transported and, and that was thanks to this alliance that was created there and that made it simpler and and, and easier for people to take part and, and, and not say oh this is so dangerous I'm going to break the law I can't do it so um, uh, something, uh, quite a lot has been done to to make civil disobedience easier, and, and this could be extended, could be taken further. And, and how do you see about collecting uh, biometric data when you protest? If I protest in, let's say, Berlin in October, there is the protest against TTIP, I would like to go there. Would I? have to put up my um, mask and or change my eyebrows because they would collect my biometric data through the videos and I'm registered immediately. Well, wearing a mask at a demo is, is difficult because there is actually a, um, a prohibition against concealing yourself. You'd have to use large eyeglasses or something, large glasses. Now, the thing at the Reichstag, at the parliament, uh, for one thing, the action itself, with all those photos and filming, of course, uh, creates its own publicity and uh, public awareness and, and reaches a lot of, of, of the public. But you have to be aware that all pictures in the net are then used by police to, to, to tell people, oh, you have been there, you've, you've been created, causing damage, and you'll be... Uh, so this is both... Uh, <laughs> You know, the and a blessing. Thank you. Time. Yes. <laughs> um, so there's not much you can do, and then uh, this could be a reason for you be getting pulled out of demos. Would you imagine that going to Berlin, they really are going to collect the uh, uh, car registrations on the autobahn? Well, you have a mobile with you, but. Uh, uh, let's say that the TTIP demo is is not going to be something that will be extremely in the focus. It, it's 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 an officially planned demo. It's going to be large. It's not that dangerous, I think. And we all have a mobile with us, so um, the authorities will know where you are. And, and and as in Dresden, they they've just pulled all the data of everyone that was in in that cell. Of course, it's good to protect yourself. Um, we could all not take our mobiles, but then we would have no pictures. Um, okay, thank you. We have time for more questions. I have two short questions. Am I allowed to? First of all, I would like to know what is your, your own connection with the subject? Have you participated in such uncommon protest actions and civil disobedience, if you might give an example or two. And the other question is, you also mentioned the naked protests, and you always think about fem, fem which is also a cool idea, because the media can't resist there as well. But you always have the feeling that for the fem, it is not an important question. Well, naked protests are great because since the 60s, throughout, they have worked. Feynman, I think, is a difficult case in a way because, I don't know, this, this kind of place with uh, the pictures that the media would like to have. Um, but there is uh, well-justified criticism from a feminist point of view. But I think nakedness in general works, uh, go somewhere naked, call the press, uh, storm Nazi pubs naked, uh, that all works and, and media can't resist it, of course. Um, I don't think this is going to be to, to wear out, particularly in a rural setting more than in, in cities. Can you also talk about your personal uh, background? Yeah, you yes, of course. Yeah. Civil disobedience is not Oh, fuck, it's illegal. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, it's a really good experience because it's a different, there's a different kind of power that, that you experience compared to a walking demo. 
uh, and it, it challenges the state, but not in a simplistic kind of way, in, but intelligently and, and, and well-founded, and that's what I like. And uh, the whole feeling, uh, late, recently someone wrote that um, it's a mixture of, 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 of kissing, snogging, and, and showing the finger. Uh, it gets kind of hectic. The police wants to attack you, but at the same time, people help each other. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly exciting situation. I, I really like it. Thank you. I really like the idea with the Secret Service. A couple of years ago, there was the idea of with always the transparent uh, actions to have a day of the open door at the B and D or uh, with the uh, secret service within Germany. Or, but the problem is that they are all in not in Berlin. Maybe we'll go there somewhere. Another thing is the December where they celebrate the seventy-fifth birthday. So let's go to Cologne. Everywhere and there. So, but on the other hand, the BND in Berlin is going to open soon. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, an open day, an open day, is always a good motto. But it would take a large alliance to 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 approach this. This would have to be mass civil disobedience, well planned, and and November is almost too short, I would say. But of course, these people are not going away. <laughs> Another question. A question continuing the previous. I noticed that in the examples you had in your talk, the Congress was not a, took not a part of it, except of whistleblowing. So data protection, data security, surveillance, and also thinking about it, I only remember one case where it started with the NSA. A student in Wiesbaden started walks towards the NSA point, and it was quite funny how the government reacted to it and the US security services. If I have, if the subject here have not managed to mobilize, what is the reason, and could we change it? Well, the fact that we don't manage to, to get a mass protest against uh, surveillance um, and that the, this topic of basic rights and freedoms has been around for such a long time is difficult. Perhaps we should try and use civil disobedience to get the debate going again. Um, they have never, it's never scaled that way that well, but you know, the annual walking demo is not the concept that will carry this forward. We'll have to rethink. Uh, it is important that people get together and uh, have a large event, but um, we'll have to think about new ways, otherwise it, it won't work. Is the subject maybe not, well, has, doesn't have a big enough moral point? Is there not enough indignation? against it because nobody, everybody says, hey, I don't have anything to hide instead of uh, with... Uh, well, maybe it's not tangible enough. People don't feel it individually. It's so far away, or this metadata. People think tend to think it doesn't affect them. We need more example where, say, a 19-year-old person, a girl is not allowed to enter the US because police have read their Facebook chats. Uh, so what's missing are these concrete, tangible examples. You don't have the neighbor that um, drills into your home and, and puts a microphone there, but in, uh, uh, in it's instead it's very abstract and uh, it's not very easy to communicate and, and, and the examples are missing and, and then of course technically it has to be explained th the way it works and then the NSA is so far away, what do they want from me? So that's the, the difficulty uh, to, for this movement to get more protests onto the streets. Thank you very much. Another question? Once you start from the quite comfortable protests in Germany, the more well-known activist forms of the recent years were the Maidan protests in the Ukraine. What could we take there from the, from the forms of civil disobedience? Or is that another step? Well, there is this debate about uh, civil disobedience uh, 
only working in mature democracies um, because uh, there you can assess the consequences. And uh, if you then look at the Arab revolutions or the Maidan protests in Ukraine, they all use the means of nonviolence because that is the strongest. The opponent, the state in this case, um, is then attacking peaceful people. And uh, this clearly shows you as the, the victor. On the other hand, violence deters people and, and, and prevents large alliances, which is the why the large alliances against authoritarian systems are those that are building on non-violence. And you can then argue, uh, of course, methods of disobedience are being used but if is this if this fits into the concept of civil disobedience i'm not so sure i cannot put up this beautiful colorful protest if if uh, if i'm being shot at uh, water or tear gas is something that you can't handle but 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 they are not going to shoot me with ammunition and uh, and this is where things get different different and and there are some certain limits to civil disobedience in in, in that